This is for the paper learning entangled single sample functions in a subset of signals model. This is joint work by me and my summer intern Hui Yuan. In this paper, we consider the problem of learning entangled Gaussians. In particular, we have n independent Gaussians with a common mean but different variances. We have one single sample from each of the Gaussians. And our goal is to estimate the common mean. Of course, we need some assumptions on the variances of the Gaussians. And there can be many different kinds of assumptions. Here, we consider one particular kind of assumption we call subset of signals. In this model, we assume that this is a subset of n variances bounded by one. And we don't have assumptions on the variance of the Gaussians outside the subset. And we don't know which Gaussians belong to this good subset. We only know the existence of this good subset. Our results consist of an upper bound and a lower bound. Our upper bound achieves a narrow array of square root n log n divided by m, the number of good points when m is larger than square root n log n. In particular, it means that when m, the number of good points, only takes up a very small fraction of the total number of data points, for example, roughly 1 over square root n, we can already achieve vanishing error, meaning that the error tends to 0 when the total number of data points tends to infinity. It also means that when m equals the order of n, then our error rate nearly match the optimal error rate for the ideal case where all the data points have bounded variance 1. Our upper bound only improve over the existing result by a factor of square root log n. However, our upper bound is a tree by a very simple and natural algorithm based on heuristics frequently used in practice. And we'll talk about the intuition of the algorithm later on. We also get lower bound for our problem. The lower bound is different for two different ranges of m. For the first range, when m is between log n and n to the power 1 over 4, we get a lower bound of the error rate, roughly square root n divided by m to the power 4. This match the existing result. And it means that when m is smaller than n to the 1 over 4, we cannot hope to get vanishing error. In the other range, when m is larger than n to the power 1 over 4 and below n to the power 1 minus epsilon for any arbitrary absolute constant epsilon, we can get an improved lower bound, which is n divided by m to the power 4 and then raised to the power 1 over 6. This improves over the existing result and also extends the result to a wider range of m, in particular, beyond n to the power 1 over 2. Now let's talk a bit about the high-level idea behind the analysis. For the upper bound, let's first consider the simple estimator by just averaging all the samples. Then the expectation of this average equals to the true mean. However, it has too large variance just because we don't have control over the variances of the Gaussians outside the good subset. Then a very natural idea to control the variance is to truncate the samples. In particular, we can truncate the samples 
a, into an interval centered around an initial estimate mu zero with interval length delta. In other words, we truncate the samples to the interval mu zero minus delta and mu zero plus delta. However, this introduces bias just because the initial estimate mu zero is different from the true mean. So this introduces some form of bias variance trade-off. So our idea is to choose a proper value for the interval length delta to get the best trade-off between bias and variance so that we can make improvement over the current estimate by averaging the truncated samples. Once we get the improved new estimate, we can do the truncation again and average the truncated sample again. Repeat this multiple times, we can hope to get a good estimate at the end of the uh, algorithm. The key is to use an adaptive value for the interval length delta. This is because intuitively, the best interval length to get the best trade-off of the bias and variance depends on how far away the current estimate is to the true mean. So once we update and get improved estimate, we should also update and use an adaptive value of the interval length delta. So this is our algorithm. We have k different stages. Within each stage, we fix the interval length delta k and repeat t times. And in each step, we truncate the samples to an interval centered around the current estimate with interval length delta k. And then we average the truncated sample to get a new estimate. At the end of the stage, we use the current estimate as the initialization for the next stage. And we also update the interval length to a half. At the end of all the stages, we just output the current estimate. And we are able to show that this algorithm achieved the upper bound mentioned in the previous slides. Now let's talk a bit about the lower bound. We show that any estimator has large error over a distribution over a family of instances. Note that each instance is specified by delta i, uh, sigma i, and mu star. So the distribution is specified over sigma i's and mu star. We assume that sigma i is sample iid equals one with probability m over n and equals sigma q otherwise for a parameter sigma q. And the true mean mu star is uniformly a random sample from positive L or negative L for a per parameter value L. So our proof is just to choose proper value for the parameters sigma q and l, such that when conditioned on the true mean being positive l, the other choice, negative l, actually has a larger likelihood with constant probability. By symmetric, we also show that when conditioned on the true mean being negative l, the other choice also has a larger likelihood with constant probability. So this intuition is the same as what had been used in previous work. Slightly more informally, let L plus be the likelihood of the mean being positive L and L negative for the other choice. Then the log likelihood ratio can be divided into two parts. 
The first part is the sum of the log likelihood of the data points with variance one. And the second part is the sum of the log likelihood ratio for the data points with variance sigma q. And our proof is by showing that the second part actually have a large variance when we choose proper value of sigma q and l. Then the total log likelihood ratio can be negative with constant probability. In particular, for the range when m is greater than n to the power one over fourth, we can design a better choice of sigma q and l and get improvement over the existing result. Please take a look at our paper to get the detail of the analysis. And thanks for listening.